Dudley? I'm going to call this meeting to order. I'm going to ask Pastor Zach Strong of Christ Church of the Heartland if he'll come and lead us on an invocation. Thank you, Zach. Good evening, let us pray, all right? Father, thank you for your goodness and grace and thank you for this incredible day that you've given us. Thank you, Father, for our great city and thank you for the mayor and the council and the great leadership, Lord, that you've given to this, to this community to lead us, Father, that our lives are blessed, that we live peaceably, and that, Father God, we are strong. And Father, we know that in challenging times and dark times and rough times, God, leadership is called on to its greatest moment. It has to shine the brightest. So I pray in these days, in the days that are ahead, as our cities are facing challenges, God, we've never faced, I ask God for your wisdom, and I ask you to strengthen them, and I ask you get to uh, fill them with grace beyond measure. And for the challenges, God, that stand, that they'll operate through your wisdom and for the greatest benefit of all. God, we just give you praise for your goodness and grace and speak peace and safety, God, over our community. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, we have three presentations this evening, and I'm going to come down front to do that. Mayor, which order are you going in? You're first. <laughs> the first is our beautiful property of the month, and it is MRV Banks. And no, he had nothing to do with this. But uh, it is beautiful landscaping if you've not driven by there on uh, Mount Auburn Road and Kings Highway. It's, uh, they've done a beautiful job, and I know you don't do any of it, but whoever does does a great job. So, good job. Thank you to the Keep Cape Beautiful group. Um, I, was, I was thinking about this right before. The first uh, organization I got involved with when I graduated college and I joined the Chamber of Commerce was the Chamber's Beautification Committee. So this very special to me and I'm going to make sure I take a picture of it and send it to Tim Arbiter. He'll get a kick out of it. So thank you to Keep Cape. Beautiful.
The second is a proclamation for Parks and Recreation Month. Whereas Parks and Recreation programs are an integral part of communities throughout this country, including Cape Girardeau, Missouri, and whereas our Parks and Recreation programs are virtually Im are vitally important to establishing and maintaining the quality of life in the city of Cape Girardeau, ensuring the health of all citizens, and contributing to the economic and environmental well-being of the community and the region. And whereas parks and recreation programs build healthy, active communities that aid in the prevention of chronic disease, provide therapeutic recreation services for those who are mentally or physically disabled, and also improve mental and emotional health of all citizens. And whereas parks and recreation programs increase a community's economic prosperity through increased property values, expansion of the local tax base, increased tourism, the attraction and retention of businesses, and crime reduction, and whereas, Parks and recreation and areas are fundamental to the environmental well-being of our community. And whereas parks and natural resources improve water quality, protect groundwater, prevent flooding, improve the quality of air we breathe, provide vegetative buffers to development, and produce habitat for wildlife. And whereas our parks and natural recreation areas ensure the ecological beauty of our community and provide a place for our children and adults to connect with nature, and recreate outdoors. Whereas the US House, U.S. House of Representatives has designated July as Parks and Recreation Month, and whereas the city of Cape Girardeau recognizes the benefits of parks and recreation derived from our rivers, parks, trails, and recreation resources. Now therefore be it resolved that I, Bob Fox, Mayor of the city of Cape Girardeau, do hereby proclaim July 2020 as Parks and Recreation Month. Julia? Very unusual month um, for us to be celebrating parks and recreation because, of course, we are in the people business. And so it does make it a bit challenging as we've had to modify a lot of our programs, activities, and facilities. Um, uh, but we are carrying on to the best of our ability. We think that parks and recreation provides that bright spot uh, for everybody. So we hope to see you uh, in the parks and enjoying our activities this summer. Thank you. Thank you. We now have a emergency emergency solutions grant presentation. Steve, you're going to do that? Yes, sir. Thank you. I am Stephen S. Williams. I am the housing assistance coordinator for the city of Cape Girardeau. And one of the grants that we administer, along with the county commission and the city of Jackson, is the emergency solutions program or the homeless program. Last year, we received uh, money from the program in the amount of the Salvation Army received $7,000. The Safe House for Women received $40,741.20. Catholic Charities of Southern Missouri received $46,400 for the homeless prevention and the uh, Community Caring Council received $46,400 for rapid rehousing, and the administration was $3,800. That made a total of $144,356.20. The requirement of this program is to match those dollars coming from the government with a 100% match. So when you match those dollars, dollar for dollar, you have a total amount coming into the county last year, last year's program of $288,714.40. The program that we are, have been approved for for the year 2020, the Salvation Army received $7,000. The Safe House for Women received $40,937.20. Catholic Charities of Southern Missouri, they received $46,400. And the Community Partnership of Southeast Missouri, the new name for the Community Caring Council, for rapid rehousing, they received $46,400. And 
the county, the city of Jackson, and the county commission uh, split up the administrative cost of $3,800. That made a total grant of $144,537.20. And you, when you match that dollar for dollar, the total amount this year in this program will be $289,074.40. The programs that we administer, the reason they are successful is because of the fine subgrantees that we have in our program. We get a chance to come to you about once a year, and then we fade in the background and do what the program requires us to do. There's a lot of confidentiality and a lot of different things that we can't share with the public, but your work is being done through these particular subgrantees. They are going to come to you and they'll make their presentation and tell you what they have done and what they intend to do. Starting with Safe House, Community Caring Council, and the Partnership. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jessica Hill. I'm the executive director of the Safe House for Women. As Steve mentioned, this year's grant, we received just under $41,000, uh, very similar to last year's grant. Um, for us, the Emergency Solutions Program helps pay for the operational costs of our shelter. Uh, we just marked the one-year anniversary of moving into our new larger shelter on June 26th. Uh, so we're very excited to have uh, wrapped up the first full year there. Uh, we did serve many more clients uh, than we were able to in the past. We really did prove to ourselves that um, the new shelter was a great need in our community and uh, we were very happy to be able to assist so many more people with residential shelter. Um, we also closed on the sale of our old shelter on June 29th. So we're excited about that as well. It's just a couple houses down the street here from where we are right now. And um, a young family bought it and they're gonna convert it back into a single family residence, which we're really excited about for the neighborhood and the community. So um, for us, uh, ESG will continue to pay for things like security monitoring, food, utilities, maintenance, equipment and furnishings, transportation, language translation, and hotel placements. Um, we have been doing a lot of hotel placements recently um, because of coronavirus and Kim Dixon, our shelter director, is gonna talk more about our COVID response. Good evening. As she said, my name is Kim Dixon. I'm the shelter director. Um, so we've requested an additional $10,000 um, from our emergency solutions grant funding to help us to pay for hotel placements. Um, due to the coronavirus, we're placing all of our clients that reach out for shelter in hotels for up to two weeks and then transitioning into our facility to hopefully prevent that from ever happening in our shelter. So um, obviously that's quite a financial burden on us um, since um, we've been impacted with this in March. We've spent, or we have placed about 350 nights. We paid for 350 nights in the hotel. So you can imagine the cost of that. Yeah. So, yes, we will continue to do the work and um, help victims, you know, as much as we can, of course. So we're still there, just a different way. Yep. We also wanted to say really quick that um, <clears throat> as one of the SEB guarantees of the city that uh, Steve Williams has been an invaluable resource for us over the course of the last 20 plus years to the safe house and um, we really, really appreciate his work on the behalf of the city. So thank you, Steve. My name is Angela Webb and I am the housing supervisor with Catholic Charities of Southern Missouri. Um, we received $46,400 to help families that are being evicted um, maintain their homes and keep their utilities on. Uh, our focus this funding year has been providing more quality intensive services to families. Um, Regina Moore is a case manager for Cape, the Cape area um, and she's been working with families uh, to provide case management services to help them find jobs and maintain self-sufficiency as they move forward to try to, as they leave our program. Um, that also includes things like budgeting, um, helping them find resources, maybe they need to apply for social security disability because they can't work, whatever that might be, Regina is the one that's, that's gonna walk them through that process. 
Um, we've been able to maintain these services throughout the COVID-19 crisis this year. We've continued to meet face-to-face -face with our clients through a variety of creative measures um, and make sure that everyone's taken care of. And moving into the next funding year, we're going to continue to work with these families and help them find self-sufficiency for themselves. Um, good evening. My name is Jaleesa Jones. I'm with the Community Partnership, formerly known as Community Caring Council, under the direction of Melissa Stickle, the Executive Director, and Calvin Garner, the Director of Housing. Um, we, under the ESG grant, we service individuals that are literally um, homeless. That's under rapid rehousing. Um, literally homeless is transitional shelters, um, places not meant for human habitation, or institutional settings less in 90 days. Um, currently this grant year we have serviced um, eight total households, um, currently servicing six. Um, as Steve mentioned, we were granted $46,400. Um, during the COVID-19 health crisis, we have been able to maintain um, contact with clients, um, still servicing um, through rental assistance. Um, we also help with um, applications and things of that nature, um, community case management and such. Um, soon we hope to be um, in our centralized location over on Sprig. Um, and so things are going great and we hope to continue. Salvation Army is not with us today, but mainly the Salvation Army provided uh, bus tickets to uh, take individuals from here to a safe place to uh, live in. Before they do that, they they verify that they're going to this place and people will accept them, and that's how they do their program. As of June the 17th, 2020, the Emergency Solutions Program has changed. The city and the county will be no longer administering the program. The way they have set it up, you can only get $50,000 per subgrantee. So the city could get 50,000, the county could get 50,000. So the maximum amount that we could get would be 100,000. Each one of the subgrantees can apply for this money and will apply for this money. They can get up to $50,000 per subgrantee, which includes administration. They will be doing the same program with you and with the county. The only difference is the city and the county and the city of Jackson won't be sponsoring it anymore. We've been doing this program for approximately 26, 27 years. It's been a very successful program and you see why your program has been successful. And if you have any questions, we'll be glad to answer them for you. Any questions of Steve? Thank you very much. I appreciate all you do. Communications and reports. Council, anybody? I just want to thank all of the members of the Parks and Recreation staff for everything that they've been doing in light of COVID-19 with Cape Splash and the 4th of July fireworks cancellation at the last minute. You guys are doing good work. It's a lot of work, but thank you for doing it and putting in that time. I, I second that. That's, they're doing a fantastic job. They really are. With all the, all the things going on around with Cape Splash and the Sportsplex and everything else, you're uh, you're doing a great job. We appreciate it. Anybody else? Nope. Scott. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I was just going to uh, mention kind of the same thing. I um, uh, don't know if everybody knew, but I was on vacation the last two weeks, and of course, it's been a uh, 
a busy time for the city. And so I really wanted to recognize our deputy uh, city manager, Molly Maynard, for uh, the great work she has done uh, during my absence and navigating through these. She's done an excellent job of that, as well as uh, all the support staff. You mentioned Parks and Rec, but it's really been every department has had its challenges with COVID, um, with uh, uh, just uh, extra burden. Plus, we're coming out of you know 15 weeks of, of COVID already and everything else. So, uh, thank you for mentioning that, uh, council members. And I just want to echo that and also uh, to recognize uh, Molly and staff for um, stepping in the last two weeks. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I. Uh I'm going to put a plug in for uh, Pastor Ben Porter and Gateway Church. They're doing a series on race, race relations in America, in conservative America. And uh, it's they had the first session last Thursday. They're going to do it the next three Thursdays. Uh, they had a panel of white area pastors this last week and had some questions that they answered. It's... Uh, uh, this next week, I think it's a group of black pastors. Is that not right, Reverend Bird? Right. And uh, the third week, it will be a panel of elected officials and law enforcement. I think uh, myself, Chief Blair, maybe the sheriff, and Mark Walker, the prosecutor. Not, not sure who else is on there. And then the last week will be a combination of those. Uh, but it is a... Uh, I was a little discouraged that there weren't more people there. I think, uh, with with everything that's going on in our country right now, but uh, it is a very open discussion of a serious issue, and uh, if you cannot be there, I think it's on Facebook Live and also on YouTube, so uh, I don't know what the viewership was for that, uh, I haven't been told, but uh, it is a, it's a unique thing happening in our community, and I would encourage you, if you can't be there, to watch it, and uh, you'll, you'll know what's going on. It's at Gateway Church in the old federal building. It's at 7 o'clock uh, the next three Thursdays. All right. Uh, Nicolette, can we post a link to the last one and then to each subsequent one on our website? So you can go directly to kate.org and then we'll try to put a link up front so that you can uh, view the one that's already happened and, uh, and in the past, in case you cannot make it, you can do it safely that way as well. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Item for discussion. We're going to have a council discussion on the uh, issue of the monument first, uh, just to hear from different council members on if, if they've got anything to say. And uh, we're going to try to do this systematically if we can. I uh, We've got it on the agenda as appearances regarding the monument issue, and individuals who wants to make comments must first be recognized, and then each speaker is allowed two minutes, and the timer will sound at the end of that time. Uh, we're going to lead off with uh, uh, Sophia Voss, uh, who is uh, uh, spearhead of one petition, and then Aaron Jones is going to do the other one. So. Uh, first of all, we'll have any, does anybody have anything they want to bring up or discuss about what's happened so far and uh, anything that's been proposed? Um, I'll start. Oh, <laughs> um, so obviously, council, we've had some discussions going back and forth um, about what to do, what, you know, and um, so originally, um, originally I was, uh, I had emailed you all and said, you know, what if we did something where it stayed, but we came up with a compromise that for Cape Girardeau to actually be a leader in this different than anywhere we've seen where we could take the groups of the, just leave it and the people that, that just want it down and we could bring them together to do something bigger at Ivers square. Um, something that was all inclusive to all to all veterans and really celebrated all veterans and not just what we currently have and really and use that that moment in time of bringing two groups together as as something that was historical in itself because 
you know, I, I believe that Cape Girardeau is unique. I, I, I believe that if any community could, could do that and bring two groups, that, that Cape Girardeau could. We could even, um, I, I kept personally, I looked at it and said there were 650 veterans that died in the Civil War, over 2% of the population at that time. Now, obviously, none of us support uh, what the cause that the Confederates fought for, fought for. That, rep that monument and those monuments do represent veterans. Now, we had discussions internally at council, and I had somebody that I respect a lot um, say, well, Robbie, that's really not a compromise because it, it stays there. And, and I was made aware of a, a recommendation to put it at the Kellerman, uh, or at the, uh, sorry, at the Lormer um, Cemetery. And I, I thought that that could be a great compromise. And, and what I internally did was I said, you know, part of our problem in society right now is that we have forgot what compromise looks like. We have the takedown, we have the keep, we have the far left, we have the far right, and nobody wants to get into this middle ground. It's my opinion, just one of, one of many. I talked to a bunch of residents who were opposed to taking it down and taking it down and, and they seemed to bridge the gap with many that even had originally wanted to have it taken down in general. Um, in my mind, it, it really, at Lormer, um, was, um, was the best thing other than created a veterans plaza at Ivor Square. It, just me, you know. Um, but my sole idea in being at Lormer was to offer a compromise and um, have a direct outcome of a location monument with not dragging things out longer and longer and longer. Um, and so that's, that's, that's where I'm at. I've told a few of you uh, that, that, that I was, that that's, that's um, after a lot of time, I've not, this is not an easy conversation. This isn't easy for any of us. Um, um, with that being said, I knew it was bound to happen and, and here we are. So um, that's where I'm at and I'd open it up to the rest of you all. so much the statue as the what the statue represent. Okay? Uh, no well I'm not gonna say nobody, but most of your Caucasians would not feel the way the African Americans feel because it was our forefathers that was they was uh, fighting about so they can keep slavery. So uh, uh, it doesn't to me it doesn't benefit the citizens here and now. You talking about 60 some years ago, and we still wasn't doing good. So now every day when we pass by there, we got to see this statue that says, yes, our, our father put and killed your people. And it, it's not a <laughs> It's not a good taste, but it's facts. And you can't run from facts. You can't even fix it because it's already making a statement. The, the Confederate soldiers, they were so, you know, I mean, well, they split the United States, so we had two of those. And then they, a lot of them died, but they reunited with the United States, but they still wanted to keep the old ways. You can't do it like that. You have to say, look, at the time when you guys was running the show, you was running the show. But now it's a new day. And we got babies coming up that don't even, don't even, understand the history of the United States, less only the statue. You know, so I'm thinking that, look, when I read that article today out of the newspaper and it said that it would go to the funeral, I uh, mean not funeral home, cemetery. but to the cemetery, I was in favor. Because I'm not saying destroy it, but I'm saying let's not put it right in the faces of those that was wounded. And I agree. Right. Okay. Is it our That's turn? What I'm Is it our turn? She said, turn your mouth. Oh. <laughs> okay, say what I said. <laughs>
I was saying, huh? Oh, okay then. Okay then. Anybody else? Stacy. Um, well, I just wanted to let everyone know um, uh, the council has received hundreds um, of emails and, and communications, phone calls on this issue. It's um, we've known nationally it's a big subject that's being discussed, but even here in Cape Girardeau, and so we've been we have been doing a lot of listening to uh, our community. Um, just wanted to assure everyone of that. Um, in the past few weeks, I've learned a lot about Cape's history, um, about the importance people do place in memorials, um, but also how one person's memorial uh, can be another person's painful reminder of a brutal history. Um, I did want to say I, I'd like to let everyone know that this discussion of what to do with this particular monument is not new. Um, when I and several, I think Shelley and Dan and I were um, uh, running for city council two and a half years ago, or for re-election, um, we all attended a, an NAACP voter forum in which we were asked about our stance um, regarding this particular monument. Um, so this conversation has been going on here in Cape Girardeau for several years. Um, it is not simply a reaction to what's been going on elsewhere in our country you know, just more recently. Um, I, I, Shelley, to your point, there's been a lot of discussion about history and um, different people's appreciation of, of how that history is um, memorialized or celebrated or um, perhaps not celebrated. Um, I see us tonight having the opportunity to uh, create history in Cape Girardeau that we will talk about tomorrow and in years to come. Um, and so, you know, history is, is a, it's a fluid thing yeah. and it evolves. Um, I just want to state, unless I hear something radically different than I've heard in the past few weeks, um, I believe that this, uh, the Confederate monument is not appropriate to the site um, of Cape Girardeau's future city hall. And so I'm supportive of it moving. Um, um, and, and my thoughts on that are that there are various reasons for that. But um, ultimately, um, it does not seem to be uh, welcoming. Um, and in fact, is that painful reminder for, for many people in our community. So that's all I'll say right now. Anybody else? I, uh, I've got to say something because I've learned the last three or four weeks I've learned a lot of history and I've learned it from uh, two pretty good Civil War historians and uh, it's it uh, it enlightened me and and, uh, and I'll just tell you uh, when when the Civil War ended, when they had these huge battles all over our United States, uh, there were upwards of, you know, they think now, 700 to 750,000 Americans that lost their lives. Uh, more Union than Confederate. And when they had these battles, there were bodies just left laying everywhere. Uh, they couldn't bury them all. And one of the things that happened right after the war was over was that the uh, federal government uh, created uh, national federal cemeteries at most every battle site at uh, Vicksburg, at Shiloh, at Gettysburg, at numerous places around the country. And a lot of those Union soldiers were collected and buried. And after that, a lot of people put up different monuments to commemorate that loss. And most of those monuments were paid for with tax dollars. They didn't do that. They didn't bury Confederate soldiers there. They just left them, they left them laying there. And 
I understand that. And I think the historians understand that. Uh, because of that, uh, a lot of people in the South said, well, if they're making cemeteries, we need to somehow raise money and do the same thing. And a lot of those, a lot of those memorials that were put up at that time were put up to commemorate fathers and grandfathers and brothers who died fighting for the Confederacy. They had, they said, well, if they're putting up monuments for the, the others, why can't we put up monuments? And that's why a lot of them were done. At the same time, you had a lot of awful things going on in our country. There were still people trying to uh, say that the white race was the supreme race, and there were still people that were pro-slavery, even though there wasn't any slavery anymore. There were still people trying to put uh, black people down when they shouldn't have been. And they associated a lot of these monuments with that movement and that same thing. And I can understand, although I'm not a black person, I've got, a, I've got many, many black friends. And I, I, can under, I can understand, I can understand why you'd look at that and feel the way you do. I truly, I do that. But, but I think a lot of that's because of just the way the perception has changed over the last 150 years. And today in our society, it's so divided, and it's divided not because it was divided like it was in the Civil War. It's just divided. It's it's not just it's not just a race thing. It's it's more than that. You got people wanting to defund the police. Our police don't need to be defunded. They need more funds. They need more funds to hire mental health professionals. They need more funds to hire people to help with all the situations they, they come across. It's not just defund the police. And you've got people around the country tearing down statues of Christopher Columbus and Ulysses S. Grant and Francis Scott Key. That makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> makes no sense whatsoever. That's your opinion. That's my opinion. And that's an opinion of about 80% of the emails and phone calls I get over the last that's month. That's because there's a lot of racist white people in Cape Dorado. Okay. What? Uh, <laughs> I've had, uh, and I and I and I do think that that uh, moving the statue is probably the appropriate thing to do and put it in the cemetery. I'm surprised it wasn't put there when they moved it from the bridge because there's over 1,200 soldiers buried there that died in the Civil War. And I just think that's a good compromise. Anybody else? If not, at this time, I'll have... Uh, Ms. Voss come up and give her presentation to council. Uh, I'm going to keep it brief because I feel like you all have heard too much from me in the past, uh, past few weeks. Um, I just want to make two points, really. Uh, first, that this monument is a beacon of hate, first and foremost. You know, it was hate when it was created by the Daughters of the Confederacy to support the Lost Cause ideology, which erased what the Confederacy did in the Civil War and perpetuated ideas of glorification of slave owners. Um, it was a message of hate when it was placed by the Old Bridge to scare black people from entering Cape Girardeau. And it's still a beacon of hate today. When I created this petition, it was covered by KFES. And um, that was really cool. You know, and my dad does work there, so I did have an in. But um, there are about 600 comments, uh, pretty much along the lines of calling me any slur that you could call a female, telling me that I should be lynched, telling me that I should be killed. I mean, it was disgusting. And, um, you know, this isn't a pity party for me, but I'm a white woman, and they were willing to spread that hate to me. So could you imagine if a black person was in my position? Yeah. <laughs> Secondly, I just want to say that... Um, I think compromise is a strong word for moving it to Lorimer Cemetery. Uh, it is still public land, and that's as if each and every one of you approved of the message that it is saying by keeping it on public land. And I also would like to say 
that moving it to Lorimer doesn't address the two main issues of A, it being historical, or A, historical, and B, that it perpetuates that idea of hate. And um, I just want you guys to keep that in mind. So thank you. Signature? Should I give you the signature? I don't need, we don't need the signature. Okay. Glasses is on. <laughs> hello, Mayor Fox and City Council members, and hello to everyone here. My name is Erin, Erin Jones, and I am a resident of Cape Girardeau County. It's an honor to be here to speak with you this evening. It is also my honor to be here to present to you this petition that urges you all with all the earnestness that we who are signatories of this petition can muster to vote in favor of keeping Cape Girardeau's Confederate monument in the public square, in Ivers Square. And I would like to clarify that this petition does specify that that, lo that that monument is not to be moved from Ivers Square, nor should any of the monuments to these veterans be moved from Ivers Square. They should all remain. I am the author of the petition, which began circulating online on June 16th, and it has since garnered 1,180 signatures. This is of note because this petition has garnered a greater number of signatures in a significantly shorter period of time than the petition that demands the monument's removal. I'd like to begin by saying that those who are with me here tonight who support this petition are not demanding a single thing. We only ask for your ear. There is a different story to this monument, one which has almost inexplicably escape the attention of most who wish to see this monument removed or relocated. This monument does not stand for, it was never designed to promote racial divisiveness. <laughs> not gonna I am not going to tolerate rudeness when somebody's speaking. Anybody else who laughs, makes any comments, out the door. Do you understand? The historical record, if one cares to take the time to look through it, and I assure you I have, clearly shows that the Cape Confederate Monument was never designed, erected, or dedicated with such intentions. Never. There is nothing there. If we choose to see this monument as such today, then it is precisely because we are choosing to see it in that way not because it was designed or intended for such purposes, and not because our local historical record supports such notions. If it did represent such purposes, if it did represent such purposes, I can assure you, this petition would have never been written. I would not be standing here today. After having completed extensive research on this monument using substantive and numerous primary historical documents, I can say with certainty that this monument was not erected to make a political statement, to intimidate black Americans, or to glorify slavery or the Confederacy. This monument was erected by individuals from this area, this region, to remember the service and the sacrifice of family members and others across this region or who were killed or maimed physically or psychologically by war. It is appropriate that these individuals be remembered and that this monument not be removed from the public square. It is wrong to single out this monument for removal. It would be wrong to move this monument to a different location. It would be equally as wrong to single out, remove, or relocate the Civil War Memorial Fountain, the James Ivers statue, or the Vietnam War Monument. 
Those whose ancestors fought as Confederate soldiers should not have their families sacrificed, downplayed, and belittled by singling out this monument for removal or relocation. To do so would be to sideline the suffering experienced by these veterans, the soldiers who were killed in action, and their families. I believe that the social impact of the sacrifice of the entire generation of individuals who lived during the Civil War cannot be understood. It cannot be fathomed by us today. Over 620,000 soldiers died in that war, leaving hundreds of thousands of widows and fatherless children in the war's wake. Such numbers are incomprehensible to us today. By all accounts, both past and present, the Civil War was particularly brutal in the state of Missouri. At least 27,000 Missourians were killed during that war, and our state lost one-third of its population as a result of death and outward migration due to war violence. One-third. Importantly, Missourians who fought for the Confederacy generally did so because they were the victims of harsh policies and brutal treatment by Union militia, not because they sought to perpetuate the evil institution of slavery. A signer of our petition, who is from the state of Missouri, noted that his family, which was from south of Rolla, Missouri, did not own slaves, but his family was brutalized by Union soldiers. The Union soldiers took their livestock, took their food, burned their farms to the ground, and then proceeded to hang his great-great-grandfather and his great-great-aunt. His family, which had previously been neutral, was left with no alternative but to fight. So his family joined the Missouri State Guard and the Confederate Army. I assure you, this story is not unusual in the state of Missouri. The war in Missouri was not a war of North versus South. It was a war of Missourian versus Missourian, brother versus brother. Understand, the war here was personal and it was brutal. The historic significance of this monument can hardly be overstated. According to the November 23rd, 1931 edition of the Southeast Missourian, Cape Girardeau Mayor Edward Drum accepted this monument, declaring that no sentiment of hatred or malice hovered in the hearts of the people of the South. Indeed, this monument was accepted by Mayor Drum as a symbol of reconciliation between the North and the South. That is what the monument stood for. So then why today is this monument, which was once heralded for the spirit of unity that it brought to our community, now derided? Why is it now derided as a symbol of divisiveness and hate? What has changed? People today are looking at this monument through a different lens. But the fact that this monument is misunderstood by so many, that does not warrant its removal or relocation. The misunderstanding underscores our need to better understand the people of that generation and the times in which these events occurred. Did you know that the woman who served as the first president of the Cape chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, Mrs. Mary Hoke, was noted in her obituary for her efforts to provide a school and a church for freed blacks in this region? No? That's okay. That's okay. But if you did not know that, ask yourself, why is that? Hers are not the actions of a racist. And she, she was the person who conceptualized this monument and began collecting funds for it. Our history is a primary target of those who wish to divide us. 
we must not intentionally remove or relocate because we today are uncomfortable with the memorials placed by our ancestors. Those memorials were placed there for a reason, and I understand that that monument was moved to prevent its destruction when the old bridge was destroyed. But that does not warrant its removal today. It is there for a reason, and it is there for us to remember. We would do well to learn, to find out the reasons that our ancestors built these memorial stones and to not simply read a historian's interpretation of them and to not simply assume the worst about these individuals. We need to investigate, reason, and grapple with our history, not sideline it, not silence it, and not relegate it to a cemetery. Let history tell its story without our interference. I thank you for your time. I urge you to take a stand for this monument. Let it once more reconcile this community. Do not let it pull us apart. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I will say that that uh, we beforehand we were going to allow the petitioners more time because they are the ones who developed the petitions and spent a lot of time researching uh, their issue. So at this point, uh, we'll let individuals come up, uh, make comments. Please state your name, your address, and limit your comments to two minutes or less. Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Sherry Estes. I live at 560 North Weston Boulevard, I'm a resident of Ward 3, Mr. Thomas. Um, regardless of what the history is, what we need to look at is what does this monument mean now for us in 2020 to keep it in a public place? It is now a divisive symbol. It is a symbol of hate. The state of Mississippi just took down from its flag the uh, Confederate part of its flag, and that was part of its history. If the state of Mississippi can take down that part of its history, the state, the city of Cape Girardeau can take down that this statue. It represents the lost cause narrative, which is, is a fiction. If you want to talk about what slavery was about, let's have a monument to an enslaved woman being raped by the master. <laughs> Let's have an enslaved man being whipped by the overseer. Our children taken from their parents, never to be seen again. If you, if you put this in a cemetery where Union soldiers died to save the Union, the Union soldiers will be spinning in their graves. The City of Cape Girardeau's seal says the Union forever. The Union forever. And we're going to install a Confederate monument on public ground. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. My name is Geneva Allen Patterson. I live at 510 Olive Street, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. This monument was gifted to Southeast Missouri by the Daughters of the Confederacy in 1931. 
This is one of the many monuments placed across the nation that was placed there to keep the memory of the Confederate States of America alive. Many of us understand the memory of the CSA to extend beyond the end of the Civil War. For many, the memory of the CSA includes the post-Civil War reign, the reign of terror that they had, that included the Black Codes, the Peonage, the Jim Crow segregation, the lynchings that happened, and the bloody Civil Rights Movement. Some in this town of Cape Girardeau were victims of this reign of terror, and others either knew it was happening or they made it happen. This monument diminishes the sense of community that should be experienced in that public square. A monument in the public square that will honor terror suggests that our current leaders, either they don't believe that the terror happened or they are proud to celebrate the terror that suffered in the past. We cannot be one cape while celebrating this terror that was suffered in this city of Cape Girardeau. The pastor, the members, and the officers of St. James African Methodist Episcopal Church, we call upon you, Mayor, Council, to follow the recommendations of the Cape Girardeau Historic Preservation Committee to remove from the public square immediately and rehome in a space where the true history can be told, and we do not want it placed in a cemetery where the monument will receive some undue honor. Thank you. Ramona Bailey, 1433 Kingsway, Cape Girardeau, <laughs> and also a member of St. James, Cape. <laughs> Uh, before I get into that, first I want to say um, we appreciate the bathroom going in at Indian Park. We come to you guys with so many other things. So it was nice to see that is being put up. Finally! But anyway, it's there. So as far as this thing is concerned, I pretty much agree with everything she said because I'm from St. James. Uh, the media removal, I think that was the best suggestion from the Historic Preservation Committee. I mean, y'all tossed the ball to them to say get their idea, see what they thought about it, and they came back eight to zero that it needs to be immediately removed because it holds no historic value. And if you move it to a cemetery on public funds, uh, where on public property, if it's being maintained by public funds, I don't see that as being something that offends so many people should have to pay for its upkeep. You know, so if y'all can find somebody who wants to take care of it for free, not on public property. Like I said, I initially wanted to just, why did they move it from the river up to here? They could have just tossed it into the river. Right. When they first, whoever decided, I'm surprised there's no record of who gave the okay to move it to where it is right now. Um, so if y'all could dig a little deeper, the historic committee already did that and they didn't come up with anything. So who put it there? We don't know. But... It does need to come down or be removed. I'm okay with it being moved somewhere where it can be given the correct narrative that it was erected for, you know, so people can know, well, this is what they tried to do. It, it lasted for a long time, but it came to a stop at some point, and this is where it ended up. So if you're not going to break it, tear it down, destroy it, move it somewhere where it can get, receive the correct narrative so people like me and we don't have to see that in a public place, you know, daily. And just to know that it's somewhere else being cared for, taken care of, is also not something that we wish to see. Hi, I'm Kelly Downs, 1847 Ricardo here in Cape. Um, I'm gonna start with a quote from Maya Angelou. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, and if faced with courage, need not be lived again. When we're talking about this, I noticed she was talking about um, the, the Civil War here. 
the reason that, that we had the Trail of Tears, you know, that's a big thing in Cape, that was to make room for slavery. The reason we pushed Indians off their land was to make room for more slavery. And so that became ent entrenched in the fabric of Missouri. And then when Union armies came in, yeah, they butted heads with people who wanted to be part of the South. And once they left, then that came back, that fervor came back. And so if we're looking at the Daughters of the Confederacy at this time, we are seeing all over the nation, in North Carolina, in places all over the country, their alignment with the Ku Klux Klan. Is that the legacy we want for, for people in our town? To be aligned with members of the Ku Klux Klan. That's not compromise. That is giving way to tyranny. And I will remind, Plessy versus Ferguson established that separate but equal is no longer. If you are forcing black people in this town to pay for something when that's not a part of the history that they want, then having that, that's not serving their public interest. <laughs> now let's look at the Daughters of the Confederacy. I'm sure you guys have, have heard all about this, but they had, have had many propaganda campaigns. They passed legislation in te textbooks in the South to make sure that textbooks were corrected to say that it was the war between the states. So we would forget that they seceded from the United States of America. So the two lasting legacies, and this will be the last thing I say, I thank you for your time. The two lasting legacies of the Civil War are the economic disenfranchisement of black people yeah. Yeah. and this cultural racism of white people. We have a choice to move forward. I will remind you that we have acknowledged the evil of slavery, but we have not acknowledged white complicity. That's what we do here now. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Michael Tennisketter. I live at 1825 New Madrid Street here in Cape. Um, I came in here today to talk to you all about the Articles of Confederation. Listed in the Articles of Confederation, it talks about slavery. The Confederacy stood for slavery. And Article 4, Section 2 and on talks about slaves. Talks about if the slaves are transported or taken anywhere or if they escape, they are legally required to come back. So, ladies and gentlemen, the Confederacy, they're losers. That's a participation trophy out there, ladies and gentlemen. And on a council that is predominantly white, to sit here and debate whether or not we should keep this racist monument, which is what it is, when we get down to brass tacks, is abhorrent. And it makes me sad that the city of Cape Girardeau has to have such a, a huge debate on moving this participation trophy piece of rock from the losers of the traitors of the United States of America. If you truly are Americans, the Confederacy has no place, zero place in this country. And to be so adamant about keeping a piece of that is honestly disgusting. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for spraying. Good evening. I'm Deborah Mitchell Braxton, a longtime resident of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, 3734 Old Hopper Road. I have two quick points to make. I'm also the executive director of Dr. Martin Luther King Junior Celebration here at Cape Girardeau and an educator. My question to the council and to the people that are here today, why would we want to preserve an era of history that is symbolic of demeaning, demoralizing, discriminating, and diminishing a race of people? Now, as an educator, we know that history is either his or her story the way they decide to tell it to us. The only black school I know about was the school my mom and dad went to, the John S. Cobb School, because they couldn't go to the White Central High School. The last point, they both graduated, by the way, is not about how or who perceives it or their intentions. It is what it represented and it's about how it makes the current citizens of Cape Girardeau feel and how it makes me feel that we've had 60 years of a little freedom. Racism does exist in Cape Girardeau. I was yep. part of it at Southeast Missouri State. I couldn't keep my job because of racism, mm -hmm. institutionalized racism. 
So by having a statue, why do you want a statue that promotes divisiveness? God bless America because he needs to bless Cape Girardeau. I'm Dr. Paul Clark. I've lived in this community for 38 years. I grew up in Cairo, Illinois before that. I've heard some amazing things tonight. One of them was that anybody that stands for maintaining a historical statue is aligned with the KKK. Are you serious? Yeah, that's not what she said. That's exactly she what said she that said. The daughters of Confederacy are aligned with the KKK. <clears throat> no. Exactly she implied the other. She, she implied the otherwise. She now, she just a minute. Hey, let him talk. He's talking to us, not you. I think we've all seen of what's going on in the United States today. Okay, I, I think we've all seen what's going on in the United States today. I don't really think we need to import that to Cape Girardeau, okay? I think it's pretty obvious where the hate is coming from. You know, when people say this monument is represents hate, that's just their opinion. I happen to agree with Aaron. I thought she made a very good presentation. And she presented some opposite, opposite views. I, read, I went down and looked at the statue today, and I was, has anybody read the plaque? Do you know what it says? I would think you'd want to keep it. It says, this monument must now remind us that their loss actually meant liberty, justice, and freedom for thousands of their fellow Missourians, meaning black Missourians. Why would you want to take that down when it makes that kind of statement? It's clear they are saying what that, stand, that monument stands for. How many people know what the Enola Gay is? We know what the Enola Gay is. Yeah, okay. okay. That, that was <clears throat> the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor 60 years ago. We dropped two atomic weapons on them. We're, we're responsible for over 200,000 Japanese deaths. We are now their allies. We do not they can come here. We do not take Japanese things down. We fought in Vietnam. You can visit Vietnam now. It's time to let the past go by and get over it. Okay? Because <laughs> it doesn't... It, who, who in their right minds thinks that any of this serves to improve relationships between black and white people? Well, I'm sorry, but you are definitely wrong. Hi guys. Hi. Hi guys. My name's Amber Moyers. I live at 624 Coke Avenue here in Cape Dorado. And keep your white tears for someone else. Like, we don't have time for this. It's 2020. Why are we still even debating this? Like, why is this even a question? The Confederate soldiers who died were not Americans. They were traitors to the Union. They don't deserve a monument. You don't go to Germany and Poland and see monuments to Hitler, do you? No, you do not. Because oppression and fascism and racism and hate are wrong. And to sit up here with your white privilege and act like it's not that big of a deal, really? Really? That is why younger generations like myself are sick and tired. That is why we are taking up the Black Lives Matter movement, even though we're not black, but we can see that systemic racism is killing people. Systemic racism is having a mostly white board of people telling us to keep a racist monument in our town. Come on, guys. Like, I understand it's fun to be a white man, but can you for one minute just one minute in your life, try to empathize with other people. One minute. Think about what it's like for Ramona or Michelle or Geneva or Leslie to have to walk past that monument. Can you do that? I don't think you can. So, I am just really livid. I can't believe we're actually having this discussion in 2020. And I cannot wait for that thing to come down. I cannot wait. I would rather see it destroyed than anything. That thing has no place in civil society, period, period. Rebuttal. Yeah. Mayor Fox, I've got your copy here. I just, I felt like I had to say something. It's really short. Leave the historical markers and monuments alone. Who are you? 
Oh, I'm sorry. Chuck Meyer, 1565 Saratoga, Cape Girardeau. Thank you. Thank you. Leave the historical markers and mon monuments alone. What are you trying to do? Change history, erase history. There really was a Confederate States of America from 1861 to 1865. It was a huge, important period of our history. How far would you take this ignorance? Remember, the Gateway Arch in St. Louis is a memorial to Thomas Jefferson. And don't forget the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. was built to commemorate George Washington, both slave-owning presidents. It's history, people. You don't get to choose your history. Where would you hide the arch? Where would you hide the Washington Monument? What would you like to do? Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Stafford Moore, Jr. I am the pastor of Mount Moriah Ministries here in uh, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. As we know, this is a touchy uh, subject, racism. In our community, we have many people on different sides with different views and different understandings of it. But as a pastor, I have to look at this thing through another lens, and that's through God's lens. Now, I believe the reason we're here is more of the problem than uh, how we got to this point, in my opinion, is the bigger problem more so than the monument itself because of the words that was in the newspaper did disturb me. Fox, you said, I think the commission bowed to activism. Could the commission also have looked at it and said this is wrong? Did it have to be them bowing to something? I believe our words carry weight. I was listening to you, Robin, you know, we friends, but you said this. You said, we don't stand with what they, those who fought for the Confederacy stood for, but yet you want to hold them up in honor. I asked you a question, how can the two meet? How can you not stand for what they stood for, yet want to honor them? Yeah. Now, I don't really care what y'all do with the monument. I'm black and I'm saying that. <laughs> I don't care. Because it's really the heart right. that we need to get to the matter of. Amen. Where is your heart? If a group of people feel like this reminds them of a time that hurt them, why would you stand because it don't hurt you and force them to endure that? Now, I could be getting myself in trouble. I don't know, but I'm up here because I feel led to. I heard the young lady said, what would Germany do with Hitler? They put him in a history book. We read about them. We able to remember them that way. When I was in Central, I read about Hitler and what he did and all those that stood with him. But we do not erect nothing to remember him. Why? Because we believe he stood on the wrong side of the argument. Now, this is something you're going to have to wrestle with within yourself. It's just brick and mortar with somebody's words who had an ideology that might differ from other people. It don't matter what that man or that woman or whoever them people said. Don't make what they said true. We got to get to the heart of what we're doing. We are the city of Cape Girardeau. And I talked to uh, my pastor friends of mine, and this was what my fear was, that we was going to be reacting rather than being proactive, that we was going to be reacting to things rather than getting out in front of things and dealing with our community so our community can, can stay healthy. So now we are reacting. Why? Because we ran and hid, because we act like we didn't see the motion and all the commotion going on around us. Now we're dealing with it because we didn't think Maybe there's a group of people over here that might not feel that way while there's another group that feel this way. Let's bring them together before we speak. So that's all I have to say. In the end, the Bible said watch as well as pray. Watch. Something is happening in our community and something is happening in our nation and something is happening across the world. And discernment will say it's time to watch. It's time for us to step out of our comfort zones and really start looking at what is going on with our people and what do we need to do to better it. That's all I have to say. Okay. Well, thank you. You're doing a wonderful job. <laughs> uh, I'm Michelle Jackson, 1824 Margaret Street. A uh, member of St. James Amy Church, owner and operator of African Cultural Collective. And I, this is a very gross, this is the most 
blatant display of cognitive dissonance I've ever seen in my entire life. Blatant. Blatant. Because you know what the Confederate history means to black people. Rape, suffering, lynching, males getting buck breaked. There's, there's tons of other things in our history. When we look at that thing, it's devastation to the stolen Africans of America. That's what that means. That's what we see when we walk by. And the fact that you can say this is a beautiful display of our history of the Confederate is an absolute insult. And why now? Why are we upset now? Because we've had 400 years, almost 500 years, of having to restrain ourselves. Right now I'm shaking right now because it is taking the amount of restraint that black people have dealing with white folks every day. And the fact that we have to look at something that y'all are proud of that represents devastation for the stolen Africans of America. We are not Americans. We are not welcome here and it shows. We are stolen people. We are stolen people. And you make it clear every day we're not welcome in America. I'm David Glastetter. I live here in Cape at 2021 Anthony Drive. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, I'm against moving or destroying or getting rid of any monuments, whether they're Union monuments or Confederate monuments. You know, if we start with monuments, where does it lead to from there? Uh, you know, Cape Girard is named after a gentleman by the name of Jean Baptiste de Girardot. I think I'm saying that correctly. Well, the French were big into slavery. I don't know if you all know that. I did a little research. It says, though the Portuguese and British dominated the transatlantic slave trade, the French were the third largest slave traders, elevated to that rank by the staggering numbers of Africans delivered to Santa Domingo, Haiti, in the late 18th century. Of the 1,381,000 Africans loaded onto French ships during the course of the transatlantic trade, 1,165,000 survived the middle passage to encounter harsh conditions, mostly in French Caribbean colonies. Today, it's tearing down monuments or moving them or whatever. Tomorrow, it's changing the name of Cape Girardeau, Missouri because Mr. Girardot was probably a slave owner. That's all I got to say. Oh, okay. Hi, Pastor George Smith, uh, 215 East Cape Rock Drive. Uh, <clears throat> sit here and I listen to a lot of this stuff, and, and I'm like Pastor Stafford. I'm, I'm in prayer, usually before I get up. Uh, because when, when you look at this argument, that really shouldn't be an argument, and you have people that will come up, and like I say, you all know how we feel. I mean, most black people anyway, and a lot of white people, seems like, that this statue, this rock, or whatever the people want to call it, what it represents to us. And you said in, 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 in front of us and to our face, basically telling you, we, you don't care what we think or how we feel. When you say, let's move it to a cemetery, that, what's, what's that? Absolutely nothing. It's taken from one spot, putting it in another spot, and the racism is still there in our face. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. Did y'all see, it was on the news, I think, and downtown the other day, there was this 12-year-old kid, and some kid came out and punched. That enraged you, didn't it? That made you mad. Okay, and, and I don't support what the, what, what the young man did to punch him. Yeah, he said whatever happens, he, that's what he deserves. But that made you mad. But you don't give a damn about us getting mad. 
about what that statue is. That's the same punch we take every day when we walk past them. But it's okay, you can see that. You can see that what happened to that young white boy. If it was a black boy, it wouldn't have been the same outrage. It wouldn't have been the same outrage at all. And I feel for that young man. Nobody should have to go through that. But you don't see what we see every day. And like I said, we got this white panel making rules and laws for us that we don't have no part of. We say this is our city, but really it's your city. All we do is we pay taxes that we're made to pay. If we don't pay them, we go to jail, something's going to happen. You make all the rules for us. You got Sister uh, Shelly on the board. But when it's all said and done, just like you're doing, you, you hired. Did y'all pay for this panel that, that did the discussion to make the uh, recommendations for what you do to the panel with, with, with the statute? Who, who called them in to do this? Did y'all ask them to come in and do it? They're the Historic Preservation Commission. That's their, usually they deal okay. with Okay, and, and so you, you allow them to go through all of this uh, uh, horse and pony show to say that eight to zero, get rid of it. Now we got to come back and say, no, I don't think we should get rid of it. Then you guys say, well, I think we should keep it. That tells us everything we need to know about you. Everybody in here who says I want to keep it, that tells us all we need to know about y'all. That statue represents racism to the highest degree. And so that tells me all I need to know about you as the mayor, as the city council. It tells us everything that we need to know about you. If, you, if you're so adamant about keeping this, that tells me what I need to know about you. And I don't even know you. But now I do know something about you. So... My time is up, they said. Hello, my name is Audra Novak. I live at 150 Enclave Circle. I'm kind of the uh, SEMO dream, right? I came here for school and have built my, my adult life here. That's the goal. You're not keeping people like me if you keep that monument. Now we've talked a lot about history. I find it very ironic that we're talking about history and education and how that's preserved in statues when it has all failed you. Um, took me about three seconds. There is the link between the Ku, uh, Ku Klux Klan and the Daughters of the, of the Confederacy. If, if I put together a group called Daughter of the Loyalist and asked to put up a picture, a statue of King George III, and I put that date as July 4th, you would all understand that I had an ulterior motive to that, yes? This statue was put up in 1930. We see what else happened in 1930? The rise of the Ku Klux Klan. We have an outdated piece of art that you were told meant an honor, a sacrifice. Con Confederate veterans were not giving veteran benefits because they were not veterans of the United States. They were right. traitors, they were domestic terrorists. Yes. Whew. If I'm this emotional, imagine how much hurt other people are going through. You do not get to hear someone say, this hurts me and argue about why they should be hurt. Right. You do not. Um, I, you know, I had some culture shock when I moved here. One I learned was bless your heart does not mean a nice thing. That may say, for the glory and sacrifice, that says you are less than, you are not welcome, and we had you where we wanted you once, and if we could, we would do it again. Yeah. That's what that says. I encourage all of you, internet's free, man. It's very easy to get some research, some accurate research. There's a reason there's not a Sons of the Confederacy. They have their own group. It's a three-letter acronym. My name is Cindy Mayer. I live at 633 Highland Drive. And um, Mr. Fox, I also have black friends. But that does not mean that as a white person, I can possibly know or the perception of what the black community sees in that statue. To me personally, it doesn't bother me. But that's because 
I don't have this history that you so eloquently spoke about. I love Cape Girardeau. It's where 40 years ago I met my husband at SEMO. It's where 20 years ago we chose to move back to to put down roots. I, like Mr. Gard, am tired of the divisiveness. I can see both sides. I think a good compromise would be to move it to Lorimer, um, to move it to the cemetery. I think you should take your, the Historical Preservation Commission's recommendation and move the statue. Thank you. I am uh, Pastor William Byrd, Jr., great, Greater Dimension Ministries. Uh, I am standing uh, because I foresaw this uh, and this happening. And I shared a couple of city council meetings ago that if we don't get in front of this, it's going to bring some things that we did not want to bring to our city. Things that were not already in our city but if we could have stepped out in front of it, we could have actually possibly avoided some of these ill feelings that we have towards each other. And I shouldn't feel that way about you. And you should, no, way. I'm just saying, and you shouldn't feel a certain way about me. And there are certain feelings that are going on in this room that we, when we walk out of here, people are gonna look at each other totally different. And this could have been avoided simply by the words that we choose to say. Mayor Fox, when I spoke to the Southeast Missourian, I said your words were insensitive. I said that because I felt that was a very kind word. Uh, because when you had a board member who wished to bring it before the committee and say, I feel like this is something that I can see that could be a problem. And for you to make those statements, it's almost as if you disregarded your counsel. And if you disregard your counsel, and if you're going to do things your way, and if we're looking at the leadership of Cape Girardeau, we need to be accountable for what we do and what we say. Now, I'm a firm believer in unity. I promote unity. And I preach the gospel. I preach the gospel. I preach the good news of what Jesus Christ can do. And what we're having here is some heart issues, some things that are going on within our heart that we need to do some self-evaluations of ourselves, of what we actually believe in and who we believe in. Because if we believe in him, then some of these things that we're saying and sharing shouldn't even be part of the conversation. But I can tell you I'm hurting. It's not like I, I thought about the Harlem, uh, Harlem Gold Riders. Mayor Lark Linden. Ah! Ah! And they start rubbing his leg. And he says it's not his leg, it's his arm. And so when people are telling you what's going on with them, you have to be man enough and woman enough to say, hey, I understand what you're saying and listen to what they're saying and then try to come to a compromise. Now, I, I could care less where that thing goes, <laughs> for real. Because what it means to me, I know it doesn't mean to you or maybe others, but you need to know what it means to me and acknowledge that it means that to me and, and have some type of empathy regarding what it means to me. Because if you haven't been beaten and if your forefathers haven't been beaten, you would have no clue of how I feel and the enraged that I feel. You would have no clue and walking into a restaurant and people looking at you different. You would have no clue because most of them are going to look like you and most of them own it. And then when we try to apply for grants and, and pails and all this kind of stuff to get a, a restaurant, we have to jump through so many, many more hoops. There's, there, is a disparity, there is a disparity in this city. But we're looking, we're looking for leadership. We're looking for leadership. We're looking for leaders who are willing to go against the norm and stand in the voice of the people. That's all we're looking for. That's all we're looking for. And once you can do that and stand firm on your decisions and not turn when somebody else comes and whisper in your ear and stand and make a decision, well, then we're going to all be in a better place. But I'm for unity. Now, the first three letters of unity is U-N-I. We're going to have to deal with some stuff with U-N-I. 
We're going to have to do some stuff with you and I. And then we can bring the T. We can tie it together. But until you hear my voice and I hear your voice and we come to a conclusion and say, I don't always agree with you, but let's do something to make this work for the both of us, we're going to keep having the same problem. But the thing about it is, this problem is not going away. Matter of fact, we can either we can put some water on this fire or we're going to fan this fire. And I pray that we put water on this fire so this does not get out of hand and not make this city a mockery among this state. City got a discount on that stuff by the case. <laughs> I'm Pat Wisman, County Road 621, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Y'all look at the skin color I have here. Look at her. Look at his. We're getting near alike, ain't we? I'm half blood Indian. Now, you hear us ratting and raving? No. Yeah. What was taken from yes. us? Our property. We were enslaved and beaten. Sir, would you address the council? I'm sorry. We were enslaved and beaten, what have you. I'd like to see an Indian monument over there myself. But I know what the council's going to do. They're going to move the monument. It's pretty well, you can figure that out. But let's move all three of them, because you're not going to make anybody else happy unless you move them all three. Very simple. All this stuff right now going on about tear this statue down, tear that statue down, Jackson changed the mascot, changed the mascot of uh, Tampa, but all these, it's ridiculous. Let's grow up. Everybody now is America. There's no black, white, red, yellow, green. But, you know, it is, but it shouldn't be. It all should be just American now. But you're going to move the monument. It's pretty well for said, but let's move them all three to the cemetery. To me, it would be respectable and a nice place to put them. Now, as for my family, like I said, I'm half blood Indian. On my grandmother's side was a Davis and a Hatfield. We all know about the Hatfields, and we all know about Davis. It was brother against brother in our family. We had both of them fight on both sides. My great great uncle was shot at Jackson, Missouri after the Civil War, coming home in his horse in a Confederate uniform. They shot him because he was a Confederate soldier. Didn't kill him, but he killed his horse, the only thing he had left. But what I'm saying is, Go ahead and move it. I'd rather see where it's at, but go ahead and move it. Be respectful. Move all three. And all this of tearing down monuments and everything from slavery, look at our wall down by the sea. Something's going to happen down there. We're going to do something there. That's our next big problem coming up there. Mark my words. But here's what I, my challenge is. Everybody said about slavery, look at your money. Give up your money, folks. You don't want slavery? And who stood for it? Give up the dollar bill, hundred dollar bills, fifties, fives, tens, all of it. But I support keeping the monument, but moving it to Larma Cemetery with all of the three. I ask you to consider that, which would be respectful to everybody, both Union and Confederate, and the black Union officers, which were not allowed to join the white Union Army by word of Abraham Lincoln. Thank you. I'm Carell Edgar. I live at 1613 Curry in Cape. I'm a resident of Ward 5. I am born and bred in Cape Girardeau in Cape Girardeau County. I'm about as white as you can get, blonde hair, blue eyes, and uh, most of my family presents the same way. I was raised here. I moved away for college and got married, and I came back to raise my son here. He's 15 years old, and he knows better than all y'all do. <laughs> he, is a, he is a wonderful student. <laughs> and he is a, a wonderful child, but he knows that that symbol means racism. All our young people know it. All our old folks need to know it. I know it. I'm 43. I'm ashamed of y'all. Honestly, I really am. If you had listened to the Historic Preservation Commission, all of them made a statement. They all made individual statements that were very well thought out, very well researched. And they did not want to just move it. They wanted it to take it down. Moving it just causes another problem somewhere else because it will become glorified somewhere else. 
And that's a huge problem. And I think we should let the black community decide what to do with it. Because black lives do matter, and we need to acknowledge that in our community, or we are going to be in big trouble. It makes us look pretty bad. It's embarrassing. Honestly, I'm embarrassed. And obviously, I'm shaking, so I'm going to sit down. My name is Calvin Bird. Uh, I am a Cape Girardian, and I am a black man, if you didn't know. I want to say two things. First of all, I'll say a few things. First of all, thank you. I thought what you presented was, was, was presented well, even though I didn't agree with it, but I think that you presented well, and I thank you for that information because I think we are Americans, and everyone should have a right to voice their opinion, which is why I'm getting ready to voice mine. And I'm going to make it brief. I was blessed a few weeks ago to speak uh, to a group of predominantly white people at uh, Cape First Church uh, with uh, Pastor Gary Brothers. And we were on a committee and we talked about unity or one voice. I gave an example of a story that has kind of got me a little credit, the street credit. But it talked about a house, the two houses being on the same street. And I own the house on the street, and I'm a black man. And Robbie, you own a house on the street, and you're a white man. But my house is on fire. And while my house is burning, you come to me and you say, not you literally, but you come to me and say, but I got a house on the street too. But my house is on fire. And if you can't see that my house is on fire, if we don't put that fire out, then everybody's house is going to catch on fire because you didn't help me. And then if you come to me to help me when you need something, then I'm going to look at you kind of funny. The second thing is I'm a pastor. I'm a preacher. And uh, I'm, I'm a third generation preacher. My father was a preacher. My grandmother and my, my brothers are preachers. My, my uncles are preachers. That's our vocation. That's what we do. So we preach. So now I'm at a podium. <laughs> and I got about 30 seconds left. The Bible says, <laughs> okay, I got five seconds left. The Bible says, when we talk about memorials, and I was thinking about a memorial and what a memorial means. The Bible says Joshua was taking the children of Israel over into the promised land. And when they got ready to cross over Jordan, the Bible says that the Lord parted the waters. And he said, I want you to grab a stone out of the water. And I want you to place that stone here on the other side so that every time somebody passes by there, they remember where you came from and what this represented. When I look at this memorial, my dear sister, and I understand what you said, but you got to understand that every time I pass by that memorial, I'm going to remember what that means. And the Bible also says, so that your children's children can remember what it means. So my challenge is, if it represents a horrific time in our past, why in the world would I want to just move it to another place so another generation of people will continue to remember what it happened and what it meant? So my brothers and sisters. I think that we need to find a way. Now, Brother Staff made a good point about we learn about history. And we learn about history in history books. I don't think that we should be memorializing a part of history that brings so much hurt and so much anger. If you are my brother, if you are my sister, even though it's something that represents you, the Bible says, if there's something that offends your brother, you take it down. Hello, City Council. 
My name is Shatez Robinson, and I live at 402 South Ellis. I'm going to make this short because we already have the facts. We already sat here for like an hour, hour and a half, and everybody gave, has given us the facts. Ms. Stacy gave us the facts the last time that we had the pleasure of being here. I don't understand why would I don't understand why you would ask the suggestion of the Historical Preservation Committee, and you ask the members of your panel, and then you just ignore them and do what you want to do anyway. I don't get it. Mr. Fox, I am so, I, I, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. I'm shocked because I had an expectation for you. Besides being a mayor, besides being, you know, the dentist that I just discovered recently. I'm sorry, I thought the mayor was a full-time job, y'all. I thought you had to be. You're a dentist too. He pretty good too, y'all. But anyway, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is I had an expectation for you as a person, as a man. And when I saw that you released that, that statement, saying that you were shocked by the committee's, like, suggestion? Oh, you let me down. You let me down big time. You let me down big time because I had respect for you. I didn't know how you felt. Like, I, political alliance and things like that, that doesn't matter to me. You know, I judge a person by a conversation, by a handshake. And we had that. So I thought we were a little bit better than that. But my mistake. She gave us the cake already. She gave us the cake. She gave us all the ingredients that we needed to make the, the proper decision on this. Remove this statue, Mr. Fox. Do what you need to do. You say, you say leadership. Just like he said, everybody's looking for a leader to go outside the norm. This is outside the norm. The normal thing to do would be to keep the statue where it is or just move it and say, okay, well, it's out of eyesight, so we can just, you know, whatever. No, do the right thing, lead in the right direction. That's it. Hello, City Council. My name is Mackenzie. I live on 7 North Benton. Um, I just wanted to say that I believe that the statue should come down. Um, moving it isn't a compromise because a compromise would be to take it down because there is no compromise whenever it comes to racism. Plain and simple. You can't compromise the fact that over 400 years people were enslaved and the Confederates fought for this slavery. You can't compromise that. In this town, we need unity. We need it more now than ever. And right now, we can't have it whenever we have a statue and a city council that doesn't want to take it down, or a mayor in general. We have to have unity because without that, nothing's going to change. Our society, our community will stay the same. I'm going to make it short because I don't want to go on and on about it because I'm not the person with all the facts, but I am a person who has lived in this town for over five years. And I can tell you that the racism in this town is alive and well. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Anybody else? How's it going, y'all? Uh, my name's Jada. I live on 13 North Fountain right down the street. Um, I have to walk by that monument almost daily if I choose to walk to work. The only thing I really have to say is it's divisive to me and the people that look like me, and I feel like that's a, predominantly a lot of us, mm -hmm. a lot of us that actually give two craps if it comes down or not because it doesn't affect, I feel like, my white brothers and sisters as much as it affects my black brothers and sisters. So I feel like the people that came to speak today, I hope that you guys take their thoughts and community like, consideration. That's all. That's really it. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Biddle, 2256 Derbyshire Lane, Ward 4. It's clear from everything we've heard today that there's pain in this room that should have been listened to long before this meeting ever happened and long before it ever had to happen. 
On the steps of the courthouse where this monument is located, slaves were sold. During the Civil War, this was a Union city. The Confederacy, who were traitors, attacked us and killed citizens of Cape Girardeau, a city and country which they chose to leave. The Daughters of the Confederacy, which was not your little neighborhood book club, friendly women sitting around. That was an organization defined by their racism, by their propaganda campaigns, and by their desire to make slavery seem okay. This monument will never be able to shake that connotation. It will never be able to shake its inherent racism no matter where you move it. It will not do better in a cemetery. And you would do well to take the recommendation of the Historic Preservation Commission. You should move this monument and put it in a museum where you can tell all the stories of how much pain this has caused to families, <laughs> to every individual, and to every community. You tell that people felt like they were getting stabbed when they walked by this and punched. You tell whose ancestors were getting raped and beaten and what that represents. Yeah. That's the history that you want to preserve from this. And that can only be done with a plaque telling that, not a plaque next to this in a public square telling that a fight for slavery was a fight for freedom. I've lived here almost all my life. And I'm ashamed that that still flies. My name is Carson Gary. I'm from Old Timber, Missouri, up north. And 856 County Road 513. And I'm a young high schooler. And they all say that they, they were teached in these schools that it was about slavery. I have read books from 1965, books, journals, and it was not about slavery. It was not about slavery. Slavery was, at, was a part of that time. But a little history, um, Robert E. Lee, the commanding general of the Confederate Army, took his black, the black children into his house each day and taught them how to read, write, and the Bible. And another thing is that you always say the black is racist, white against black. And way back, blacks went into other black tribes and captured them and sold them to other people. They were, it was not whites against black. It was blacks from blacks against the beginning. And it just turned out the whites against blacks in the end. And it's not whites against blacks. Tons. Only 5% of the Confederate population owned slaves. And tons didn't even see of the Confederate soldiers. And there was lots of black men who fought on the Confederate side. And they fought protecting their home that they thought were being invaded. And then when they, after the war, these black soldiers went to give up and the Union would not recognize them as soldiers. They would not recognize them as men. They put them down. And, yeah. keep this short as well. Um, my name is Madeline Anderson. I live on 1512 Bessie Street. So I just heard him mention the Bible. I think that's a common occurrence to um, people all lives matter. Um, I was, um, I went to a Christian school, private school. Um, the first thing I learned as a child was to love thy neighbor. So what really confuses me is how we can see color and you like everybody's a person, everybody's a human being. 
And I just don't understand how you could even comprehend that. I just really don't know how it got to this. I don't understand how people think a Confederate flag is right. I don't understand how these people for years have been treated like they're nothing. So I think you need to figure that out. Anybody else? I recommend that she gets a raise tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any appearances for any other items not listed on the agenda this evening? If not, we'll move into agenda review. We have uh, three public hearings tonight. The first public hearing is for a rezoning of property at 920 North Middle uh, from R2 to RUMD. Our second public hearing is also a rezoning at 900 South Kings Highway from M2 to M1. And then the third public hearing is um, <clears throat> to rezone property on the north side of LaSalle Avenue, east of the Baldwin Drive from C2 to R1. Uh, each three of these have been through um, our planning and zoning and come to you tonight as a public hearing and the first reading of uh, several uh, of the items on your agenda. We have uh, the consent ag agenda consists of the second and third readings of uh, ordinances from last time of a record plat at DeWitt subdivision of accepting the permanent utility easement from uh, <coughs> uh, Morgan Distributing and uh, uh, a knowledge receipt of the annexation petition from Mid-America Mid Highway K. The uh, <coughs> number eight is a um, resolution to distribute the request for proposals for the 811 Broadway project uh, and move that forward. And then uh, we have the acceptance of the public improvements at Morgan Distribution. Um, are there any of those items on the consent agenda that you'd like to remove from the consent agenda? Yes, that's that's number 10. It's already removed. Thank you, uh, Dan. It, um, that'll be bill number 2106. Uh, this is the recommendation of the Historic Preservation Commission regarding the monument in Niver Square. And uh, it's been removed so that you can discuss that and determine uh, and a resolution has been proposed, which would accept that resolution, uh, accept that recommendation as proposed. We have a few new ordinances. Like I said, the first, uh, um, the first three are from the public hearings. And then uh, number 14 is a change in uh, speed limits on, in Chapter 26. This is to match uh, MoDOT's um, recommendation of speed limits in construction zones. And, this is, and then number 15 is uh, a permanent easements from the Liberty Apartments. Uh, 16 is the permanent utility and sewer easements from Decatur Street right away. And then 17 is uh, the 30-minute parking along Broadway Street. This is uh, in front of Mississippi Mutts. So uh, those items. And then uh, we do have a closed session item tonight mm -hmm. for your consideration. Yes. We do. Yes. Really? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's all I have, Mayor. Okay. Uh, we'll now move into regular session and have a roll call. Bob Fox. Bob Fox. Here. Robbie Gard. Here. Stacy Kinder. Here. Shelley Moore. Here. Dan Preston. Here. Nate Thomas. Here. Shannon Truxell. Here. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Okay. Motion moved by Robbie, seconded by Nate. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? 
That motion carries. We have three public hearings this evening. The first is a public hearing to consider a request to rezone property at 920 North Middle Street from R2 Single Family Urban Residential to RUMD, which is Residential Urban Mixed Density. Anybody here this evening to speak on behalf of this public hearing? If not, I will close the public hearing. The second public hearing is to consider a request to rezone property at 900 South Kings Highway from M2 Heavy Manufacturing Industrial to M1 Light Manufacturing Industrial. Anybody here this evening to speak on behalf of this public hearing? If not, I will close that public hearing. The third is to consider a request to rezone property located on the north side of LaSalle Avenue, east of Baldwin Drive, from C2 Highway Commercial District to R1 Single Family Suburban Residential. Anybody here this evening to speak about this public hearing? If not, I will close the public hearing. Anybody here tonight want to? comment on any item on the agenda this evening. Any comments for, for any item on the agenda? If not, we'll move into the consent agenda. Eric? Bill number 20-96, an ordinance proving the record plat of DeWitt subdivision, ordinance proving the record plat of DeWitt subdivision, Bill number 20-97, an ordinance accepting a permanent utility easement from Morgan Distributing Inc. for property located at 4110 Nash Road, an ordinance accepting a permanent utility easement from Morgan Distributing Inc. for property located at 4110 Nash Road, number 20-98, a resolution acknowledging receipt of an annexation petition from Mid America Highway KLLC and setting a public hearing regarding the proposed annexation. Number 20-105, a resolution authorizing distribution of a request for proposals for property at 811 Broadway in the city of Cape Verde, Missouri, and authorizing certain actions connected therewith. You have before you the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Robbie, seconded by Dan. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 20-106, a resolution of the Cape Girl City Council to accept the recommendation of the Historic Preservation Commission regarding the CSA monument in Ivor Square in the city of Cape Girl, Missouri. Motion by Dan. Second. Seconded by Shannon. Any discussion? Can I, you, can I, can we just be reminded of exactly what is stated in the, uh, the recommendation? I, I, I'm not saying read the whole thing. I'm just saying what, what, what just the the part of it, and I please staff fill in. But it was that it to be be taken down immediately. Immediately, or no public. It was that no public property, and no funds to be used in perpetuity for that. So the recommendation is that it it does not end up on on any kind of public property. And the last part was what? No public funds. No, no, no public no funds to, to be used. Should not be on public property or supported by public funding. Correct. And and I and I would. I would go back to the way we started, and what I said is that I I like I said I thought a compromise was, the Lormer Cemetery, from from what I heard in constituents. I thought that, that was a compromise. Um, I would not. Um, I wanted to know what we were going to do with it regardless. I, I wanted a decision on because I didn't want this dragging out any much any further because that didn't say what we were going to do with it. It just said tear it down immediately. That unless I'm hearing that proposal. And that's where I have 
a problem because I don't know where it's going to go. Well, and so for me, from the beginning of this conversation, I've thought the best place for this is to be in the River Heritage Museum. Mm -hmm. We are a community that has a River Heritage Museum that is supposed to frame the heritage of the river region. And so I, I feel as though that would be the best location for it. The difficulty of that is that that is technically a piece of public property. And so that building is an old fire station. And so that's, a, that's the, my hang up with, this, with the verbiage in this is that I, I, I personally have thought that it needs to be in the River Heritage Museum from the beginning. And so, but it's, it's, it is public property and that's, that's the sticking point that's tough with the exact recommendation from the Historic Preservation Council. The, the public property issue is also a stickler with me because of the, both those reasons. And I, before this Kellerman Foundation ever came to fruition, I had already written down what I thought was a good recommendation, and that would be to refer this to staff, to let them do research in consultation with the Historic Preservation Commission, with the Kellerman Foundation, or whoever they deem necessary, and then find a place to put it. You can't just walk out there and take this thing down immediately because, number one, you've got to hire a monument company. Uh, you got to know what it's going to cost. you got to go, if it goes to the museum, they've got to be prepared to have a place to put it. They've got to do some stuff to arrange for it. Same thing with the cemetery. You can't just take it down and, and stick well, it out there. Well, right, but at least if there was having it. I mean, here, here's, here's My, the heartburn, Bob. The heartburn is going to be is that out of this meeting tonight, there needs to be a decision of whether it stays or whether it goes. Now, I would like that if, it, if it's got to go, that I would like to that compromise. That's just me. I would like the compromise of, of the cemetery. That's, that's, but right now it needs to be, is, is there going to be an amendment to what we have on the table to decide where it should go now? Or is it just, or you just want to leave it to take it down? Stacy? Can, can I ask staff, uh, if we don't decide tonight where the final resting place of the memorial would be, how, could you, could you conceive of a time frame, a short time frame to get back, to, to come to a good decision? To, maybe there are several, I mean, we've talked about two ideas. Uh, maybe there are others. I, I don't know. Um, but c could we say, you know, within a month or two weeks or whatever it is, could could the, those groups discuss and g get this figured out? I, I don't know, and, and we'll let Molly speak to. I don't know if if there's been any working of that those details, because it is a huge monument, and and uh, even even at Lorimer with all the room there is where it would be, what contextually makes sense, and just physically getting it into the, into the cemetery is a huge challenge. Um, I assume the museum would have similarly huge challenges for that. Um, I, so, so to be able to tell you, yes, it can go in one of those places, I, I don't know that we can say that tonight. Molly? Mr. Meyer, if you don't mind, in the uh in the resolution itself, it talks about the immediate removal of the monument from Ivers Square to storage until such time as a permanent home can be found mm -hmm. for the monument. And then it has the provisos about not being public property or public funds. So it does envision the removal and a decision process as to where the final property is in the passage of it with this language. The, with that language, though, the concern would be is that you take it down and nobody, I mean, nobody wants it. Nobody wants it, and we can't even, we adopt this resolution and we can't spend one dime on it. Like, theoretically, how are we going to pay to get it moved? I only wanted to clarify that. I, no, I know. I'm just. Well, and that's the sticking point because then you're moving it twice because you're moving it in storage and then moving it to another place so like we've got to make sure that that the resolution it, it, you know we've, we've got to make sure that if we amend the resolution that it actually is an amendment that 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 is able to get this to a place hopefully a heritage museum where it would our 
our alternative would be to not accept their recommendation and come up with our own recommendation to at least that's why I said let staff research where the proper place is going to be to move it. I, I hate to pay for moving it twice. What, what or three times? Do we know what Molly, that cost you, at all is? Molly, have you? Uh, we have not received any estimates to, to remove the monument at this point in time, nor have we had any conversations with the River Heritage Museum or other other entities until we knew what their, our parameters were. Um, and again, the public funding, public property provision in the HPC's recommendation does significantly limit um, our options. So my suggestion would be if, if the decision is to remove it, would be to remove that provision so that we can bring a variety of options forward for your consideration that might include, it might include private property, but it might also include entities that are either on public property or receive um, public funding. Even a lot of private museums receive public money uh -huh. in the form of a grant. So we need to be very specific about if that provision is included, what does that mean? What's the extent of that? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, did, Mark, did you have a statement that you wanted to? Well, just having been being on the Trust Preservation Commission, I will say I think the initial concern was more if it was going to be on city property. My recollection is Dr. Hoffman, who was at the commission meeting, um, pointed out about Southeast and, and, and saying public property rather than city property. I think if there was a consensus to want to move it to the river campus, I think the Historic Preservation Commission would be receptive to that. I, the one thing we said was that wherever it is moved, it should have some signage to contextualize everything. Um, so I, I think the, the thing about not being on Southeast property was something that kind of came up at the end, as I recall, and Molly might have a different view, um, was something that Dr. Hoffman had mentioned. I think that the, the big thing was the mission didn't really want to move it to the, to the cemetery. We thought it needed to be at the museum. Um, and so, uh, but obviously we didn't know where that was going to be. So I, I think the commissioners exactly to look at that possibility. Dan mentioned stuff. I don't, I don't think the commission's totally opposed to moving it to the river campus. I think that thing kind of came up at the end, but I think where our focus was not to have it on picture of the city property. To me that if we move it back, oh, sorry. If we move it back to where it came from, it hasn't. It's not happening at all. I mean, crossing the bridge, you see it. Going back over the bridge, you see it, and you know that it used to be in over here on Alarma. So it ain't really helping the 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 population here in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. What I think we are missing is is that we we want to keep this as a lover but yet we can't love it because you it's too much pain uh invested in this thing so going to the cemetery they don't want that neither so the best thing i think we should do maybe investigate some of these uh other cities that may not have the same issue <clears throat> may not have the same issues that we're having right now and that is we trying to keep peace in this community we are already uh, tight, you know. So I think that putting that over there by the bridge is saying, you know, yeah, when you get ready, when you get ready to cross this bridge, you're coming over into Confederate land. I don't think that's a wise move. We're trying to bring unity and not destroy Cape Girard, Missouri, you know. And I know that you all don't, maybe a lot of people don't see it like that, but that's how I see it, you know. So. I don't think that we should, I think we should take time, not take time because they said get rid of it, but I think we should put it in somewhere until we can find out where it can go and it'll save a lot of uh, pain. That's my, that's my opinion. And I know some of us sitting here loves the statue, but there's also some of us sitting here that don't. So yeah, you split right there. So. And if you go on Seymour's land, 
I mean, with all the different nationality of people, they ain't gonna like that. The people like, I don't know about Zemo, but the people like, it doesn't re uh, register anything. It has no, it has nothing as far as I'm concerned that says this is something that we need to love, because it ain't. Well, with, with the last statement in that resolution from the HPC, we mm -hmm. can't move it to the museum, we can't move it to the cemetery, you just have to put it in storage. Well, that's, decide, that's what, techni te te is technically else, we couldn't even take it to the dock. Technically, well, we couldn't, we couldn't do storage. anything because we've got to use money yeah. to move it. Yeah. Well, we have to. Will the council need to approve You'll funding have to, to move? This? No. Okay. Hey, this is going to sound real cheap. Can we box it up right now, like they did with the Ivor statue, and just you know box it up with during all of this construction? So then it, 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 we would be able to figure out where we can, we can go with this. It's hard to box that looks like deception. And a half ton. What was that? I think, <laughs> the, I think the language like in the resolution. Hold on. Well, because, hold on. Hold on. Eric. Eric. I think the language in the resolution would support that. Again, it says the immediate removal to storage That's until such saying. time as a permanent home can be found. And then it says the new home would not be on public property or supported by public funding. So I don't think the fact that you'd use money to move it somewhere is a support of it. Okay. Um, so right. I, I think you've got the leeway that you want uh, by but adopting the, last, the resolution the as it would is. preclude okay. us from putting it even in the museum. Sure. Well, I move that we strike then the last part of that, of the statement. And you want to put it in the museum? No. I. I, I However, it's read. I'm sorry, I should have written it down. But um, with a period after contextualize. I'm, you're gonna. Have to, I'm sorry, Eric. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll read it without that last phrase. Um, yeah. Recommend the uh, immediate removal of the Confederate States of America monument from Ivor Square to storage until such time as a permanent home can be found for that monument, including covenants to ensure that it is appropriately contextualized. Period. And then the after that says what? The, after that said, and that the new home should not be on public property or supported by public funding. That is what you've moved. I would moved move to, to strike, strike that right. from. So you want to make an amendment to that resolution? Yes. Okay, do I hear a second? Second. We have an amendment and a second. Any further discussion on the amendment? I have a question. You can't ask a question. <laughs> Any? Any further discussion on the amendment? So this is, you know, it's adopting everything that the, the Historic Preservation Commission mentioned, except for the, it, we would strike out the public property and public support, public Robert. funds. Robert, so you're keeping your orders, options we're open. Just considering, we're just, we're just considering the striking of that. Striking of that, yeah. The rest is independent. Yeah. It That's keeps it. the options open for the future to have more options second. for it to go somewhere else. We have else. a second. We've had discussion. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Now we have the resolution. Any further discussion on the resolution? The amended resolution. And I, just to be clear, I am suggesting this uh, because it sounds like there there may even be things that, that haven't been discussed tonight as possible ideas or hypothetical situations that we haven't, we're not aware of yet that we we're trying to not Trying to avoid or trying to keep doors no. open, options open. So that's, I'm not, I don't have any clear goal in mind when I'm proposing this. Okay. Um, just other than we're taking it down and we're going to do something with it in the future. That I, I, not that I was just going to say that I understand. Um, I wish we had a I wish we had a clear cut way somewhere to put this. That's where I have heartburn with this. I wish we had an, somewhere right now that we knew where to go. Um, I think we've drawn little, this out. Gonna, I understand. I just, research. but I'd I'd rather, you know. I'm still a fan of Lorna. We'll go from there. Okay. All those in favor of the resolution signify by saying aye. I didn't, I didn't understand it. You saying what Robert just No, 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 no. I just made it, I was just a, a, a discussion topic. That's it. Yeah. I didn't amend, I couldn't. I thought everybody would talk. We're done. Okay. 
So all those in favor of the resolution. You had a as first. Amended, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay. The motion carries. Now, ma'am. I was just. Uh, now she, you can ask questions. Can, well, I, I, we were in the midst of a discussion. I didn't want to be interrupted. So if you have something to say, I'll hear what you have to say. I, I would just ask Ms. Kinder if she would consider, and I don't know, maybe moot now, but the, um, that there be something added to the resolution that say something about it says something about it being contextualized. That was already in a museum. Already, that, was already in the, that was already in the that was in the resolution. That is that is in what we just passed. That, that it doesn't doesn't say, but it just said contextualized. It didn't say. I mean, the, clearly the discussion uh, implied that, but what you actually passed didn't say that. So so if you huh? It did say that. It didn't say that. Whereas on June 23rd, 2020, the Historic Preservation Commission held a special meeting and voted unanimously to recommend the immediate approval of the Confederate States of America monument from Iowa Square uh, to storage until such time as a permanent home can be found for the monument, including covenants to ensure that it is appropriately contextualized, period. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the City Council. Okay, so it doesn't say, I mean, it could be contextualized sitting outside someplace, right? Um, and I, think, I, I, I don't think that that would satisfy I any think of the, the, in, the people I think that the were in, in here. The um, intent here is to have that contextualization with, with if that's, consult with the Historic Preservation Commission, with the community, with the but community. But you're talking Foundation. about it being in a museum, and if you're, if that's, the intent that should be in the resolution. That's Unfortunately, this isn't done yet because we've got to actually come to a decision at some point about where it goes. So there will be ongoing discussion. The only thing that we've done is we've accepted the historic preservation's recommendation with a caveat that public funds or places could be used. That's where my question comes in. Mark, can I why, just, just how I had to go ahead. So how is that any different from being where it is now, moving into somewhere else with on public property, uh, being cared for with public money? It's not, because it's not. a lot of people said they would like to see it in a museum. The museum here is public property. We can't even consider that museum because of exactly. that. Exactly. So I would, and that museum never it never came out of most of the people's in here mouth. Um, no, but it did come out of, it's come out of a lot of people's mouth that weren't here. We were not me. for the monument in the first place. So that was on the Historic Preservation, Pre Preservation Committee's original recommendation. I'll let Mark speak to reason. that because he's on the commission. Uh, we, I know. We did not feel that it should be destroyed and we felt it should be in a museum and the purpose of the, of the phrase about contextualizing was it, it came up if some, for example, a private museum wanted to put it in their museum, we would want to have signage that explains, you know, slavery and all that, that, that you know, that not that they couldn't say, put it in the museum to glorify uh, slavery or something like that. So that's why, you know, to have, to have contextualize it and stuff, so that there would have to be some signage with it. It, it wouldn't just be put in a building and with no explanation. Nothing done, no explanation. Okay. Right. That that was the purpose behind that. Thank you, Mark. Uh, new ordinances. Bill number 2099, an ordinance amending Chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri by changing the zoning of property located at 920 North Middle Street in the City and County of Cape Girardeau, Missouri from R2 to RUMD. Motion by Dan. Second. For the Second. I didn't, but I didn't hear what she said. Don't worry about it. Did I hear, did I hear a second? Yes, second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Bill number 20-100, ordinance amending chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances in the City of Cape Girardeau, Missouri by changing the zoning property 
located at 900 South Kings Highway in the city and county of Cape Charm, Missouri from M2 to M1. Motion by Dan. Second. Second by Nate. Any discussion? Mayor, please mark my vote um, as abstention due to financial conflict of interest. That's done. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 20-101, an ordinance amending chapter 30 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Cape Town, Missouri by changing the zoning of property located on the north side of LaSalle Avenue east of Baldwin Drive in the city and county of Cape Town, Missouri from C2 to R1. Motion by Stacy. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Shannon. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 20-102, an ordinance amending chapter 26 of the Code of Ordinances in the City of Cape Town, Missouri regarding speed limits and penalties. So moved. Motion by Robbie. Second. Second by Dan. Any discussion? I hope I don't have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> don't get caught. <laughs> I know how he drives. <laughs> Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 20-103, an ordinance accepting a permanent utility easement from Liberty Apartments of Cape LLC for property located at 1145 Walnut Street in the city of Cape Charm, Missouri. So moved. Motion by Robbie, seconded by Dan. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Bill number 20-104, an ordinance to repeal ordinance number 5076 regarding a permanent utility and sewer easement for unimproved De Decatur Street right-of-way in the city of Cape Charm, Missouri. Second. Motion by Dan and seconded by Robbie. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Bill number 20-107, an ordinance amending Schedule G of Section 26-249 and Schedule R of Section 26-248 of the City Code by establishing 30-minute parking along Broadway Street in the City of Cape Town, Missouri. So moved. Motion by Nate. Second. Second by Shannon. Any discussion? I just wanted to thank um, the City staff and Scott for for uh, taking this into consideration. This is a great example of our downtown businesses having success and due to that success running into some unique situations and we're trying to meet them i have no doubt this is a moving target because as more businesses that we hope move in down there and continue to to have success we're going to run into issues and this you know this is one way that we hopefully can counteract an issue they came up with but That's true. yep absolutely all those in favor signify by saying aye aye any opposed that motion carries at this time, I'll adjourn. I don't think we have any appointments. We have no other business that I'm aware of. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn to closed session to discuss issues listed in the revised section of Missouri, section 610021, including but limited to legal actions and litigation, confident, confidential communications with legal counsel, and property transactions. Second. Motion made and seconded. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.